Porque por muitos anos, por muito tempo... You're going to hear a lot of TikTok videos in this episode, some controversial, all from across Latin America. It shows Michelle Bolsonaro saying, in her words, for many years the presidential palace of Brazil was a place consecrated to demons. And she says now instead, today Planalto is consecrated to the Lord. This is my colleague Luis Fajardo, and there was something going on on social media that grabbed his attention. Yes, there's a phenomenon across Latin America of evangelicals being particularly skilled at using social media and in particular video sharing platforms such as TikTok to expand their political presence. Now they are employing in a very, very effective way the new social media tools. This episode of the Global Jigsaw is about what happens when evangelical preachers with a political agenda meet TikTok. The mix can be dynamite. So who is this alliance helping? And what does it tell us about politics in Latin America today? I'm Krasi Twig, and this is The Global Jigsaw, an original podcast from BBC Monitoring, zooming in on political security and social shifts around the world through the lens of its media. Our team listens to, watches, and analyzes media narratives in 100 languages. Radio Tehran. Right, we must go now to Moscow. We are not targeted on the territory of Ukraine. Western countries are not the international community. That era has finished. I mean, have you got any thoughts on that? Yes, we have got some thoughts. In this episode, as well as Luis Fajardo, you'll hear Rachel Kriegia, who is also from BBC Monitoring, and Rafael Abuchaibe from the BBC Spanish language service Mundo. Luis is Colombian with a PhD in 18th century history. He is based in Miami, from where he observes and analyzes social media across the whole of Latin America for BBC Monitoring, which is quite a job. Of course, it's an entire continent, multiple languages, and a multiplicity of voices, you know, and it's growing so much with all this social media revolution. Perhaps some time ago, it was easier to look at the established media in these countries, but now it's perhaps even more relevant to see what is trending in social media, and that is often one of the first things we have to do when we start our day in this team. Back in October 2022, there was one huge story. Hoje, tem um único e grande vencedor. O povo brasileiro. Brazil's presidential election. There was speculation at the time that, despite every poll putting Luis Inácio Lula da Silva well ahead, the evangelical vote, energized via social media, might still get their man Jair Bolsonaro re elected. Luis found himself immersed in TikTok in the run up to the election where evangelical preachers were much in evidence. Here's one called Davy Leonardo, with a typically partisan post. My main mission is to talk about Jesus, but I can't close my eyes to what is happening. We're not in a war between two politicians, of Bolsonaro against Lula, or of Bolsonaristas against Lulistas, but between two ideologies. One is evil, that brings destruction in its path, just look at our brothers in Latin America, where the left has taken over. He's very, very influential. He's got 6.3 million followers on TikTok. One of the things he claims is that he has the largest YouTube channel of any individual preacher in the world, with 8 million followers, and also 11 million more in Instagram, where he regularly appears with other global icons, such as the football star Neymar. So he's a social media powerhouse, besides being a very important evangelical personality in Brazil. But although the result was surprisingly close... In the end, the socialist Lula prevailed. 
back in October, straight after the election, some significant people on TikTok were not happy. E mais, a metade da população brasileira não está com o Lula. Half of Brazil's population is not with Lula. Half of Brazil does not accept socialism. That is why I want you to be strong. Keep your spirits up. The Workers' Party is in decadence. They only won by 1%. Half the country did not accept the Lula presidency. So this might sound like any political activist trying to make the best of a defeat. But there's a detail. In the strapline on this video, you can read, Deus está no controle. God is in control. It's from another very political evangelical preacher, André Valadao. He has a relatively modest following of just over three quarters of a million, but some of his posts get a lot of views too. The early days of Lula's new term as president were violently interrupted on the 8th of January, when thousands of Bolsonaro supporters stormed Congress, the Supreme Court, and the presidential palace, doing huge amounts of damage. And a few evangelical figures are believed to have been involved. After the attacks, there were all these videos and social media showing some of the activists praying, like holding Bibles and shouting their allegiance to Christ. The local media sources also reported how some lesser known evangelical figures were supporting the protesters. And at least four evangelical pastors were detained during the unrest. So now there's two big investigations going on, one by Congress and another by the police. So we had to wait to find out the extent of their involvement in the attacks. Let's pause for some context on the media landscape, which is relevant to our story, with Rafael Abuchaybe from BBC Mundo, the BBC's Spanish language service. Until nearly a decade ago, private TV and radio networks controlled by corporate interests, enjoyed the lion's share of audiences in Latin America, while print media remained influential in elite circles. Social media has upended this and now provides a large part of the population with news and information. At the same time, print media has collapsed in many countries, although traditional broadcasters remain important especially for older people. In 2020, more than 80% of Latin Americans had access to the internet. Close to 70% of internet users in Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil are now on TikTok. Social media becoming a major source of news can be a game changer for those seeking a political foothold. Back to Luis and the preachers rooting for Bolsonaro in Brazil. Bolsonaro's victory in 2018 was such a massive surprise and people were asking where did it come from. And one of the currents that has been identified was the activism of evangelicals who used very often messaging apps like WhatsApp. And since these messages were not easily monitored, were not apparent in the mainstream media, that is one of the reasons why it was such a surprise when Bolsonaro won the first time around. As these political evangelicals discovered video-sharing platforms, they became much more visible, although many of their video messages are surprisingly dull, not much singing or dancing, as we've come to expect. But they're not all straight-to-camera monologues either. Yeah, so here's a bit more of André Valadao. Some of his pro-Bolsonaro videos were sometimes a bit more produced, like this one before the election. In 89, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, O socialismo precisava se reinventar. E essa reinvenção aconteceu na América Latina. They're showing the fall of the Berlin Wall and suggesting that, in their words, socialism needed a place to reconstitute after the fall of the communist bloc. And the place where this could be happening is in South America, in Latin America. E tomaram conta das mídias para transformar os ditadores em heróis. Bolsonaro himself directly targeted the evangelical vote, sometimes via his wife, as we heard earlier. But I wondered about the visibility of other female evangelicals during the campaign. There's definitely some very high-profile evangelical women. For example, the young evangelical influencer Fabiola Melo. She has 2.5 million followers on Instagram and 3.5 million on TikTok. And this is, of course, not trivial. 
eu começo a observar que tem a maioria são pessoas que eu não concordo com os princípios delas e elas discordam dos meus também. She's então, saying here that as a Christian she finds Lula's position unacceptable. Actually, she literally says indigestible. And because of this, she says voting for Bolsonaro is the only alternative. Are there any other TikToks by evangelicals that went viral in this election? There's so many of them, but one that I found really interesting was this post by Nicolás Ferreira, who's a 26-year-old from Belo Horizonte, Brazil's third largest city, who also ran in October for the Federal Congress. He's an evangelical Christian, although not a preacher himself, and he's also a very powerful figure in social media. One of his posts with nearly one million views carried the caption, the left is infiltrating the church. And the left wants to manipulate children at the church. Dá só uma olhada nessa mulher aqui e no que ela fala a respeito da infiltração da esquerda na igreja. He complains about what he calls the use of left-wing ideology by religious leaders close to the Lula candidacy. Did he actually win? He won big time. Actually, he obtained the largest vote of any candidate in Brazil's lower house of Congress. But Bolsonaro did not win. And did Lula's campaign actually address evangelical voters at all? For long parts of the campaign, Lula seemed to be deliberately abstaining for trying to reach specific religious groups. One of his campaign ideas was that he was going to be the president for all Brazilians, no matter their faith. However, as the election got closer, he started to woo them, sometimes using proxies. Lula vai fechar as igrejas evangélicas? Verdade ou mentira? Mentira. Lula garantiu a liberdade religiosa. In this social media, for example, posted in a pro-Lula account, the narrator says it is fake, it is fake news that Lula plans to close down evangelical churches. Talking about fake news and disinformation in Latin America, we have an expert on that, my Venezuelan colleague Rachel Kriegier. Like Luis, she also works out of Miami. Social media has played a positive role in making news more accessible. It makes access to information more inclusive. It has also played a positive role in politics, making it more accessible to the wider population, giving more people the ability to reach audiences directly. But it's inevitable that disinformation, fake news, has played part of that dynamic because of people's high reliance and growing accessibility. So misleading claims are having lots of influence on people's political decisions. We'll hear more from Rochelle later on the kind of disinformation that thrives on the continent. The evangelical figures we're talking about clearly have a lot of followers and some of their posts get a lot of likes. So questions about disinformation are especially relevant here. But how do we know when social media messages are making a difference? Luis says it's not just likes and followers. These videos have entered the national discussion. You can see even traditional media obsessed about these videos. And also, there have been really dramatic examples of candidates who have entered the race at advanced stages and on the strength of being very powerful in social media, completely upending these campaigns. And it's not just Brazil. In Colombia, there's this example of a preacher blessing the candidacy of the Colombian presidential hopeful, John Milton Rodriguez, who was himself the founder and general pastor of the Mission Paz Church. This has to be understood in a context of evangelicals becoming very powerful as kingmakers. One of the ways you can see this is how every other politician is trying to court them. Even in Colombia, for example, the presidential election, which was extremely, extremely polarized, a candidate from the hard left and a candidate from the hard right eventually reached the final stages in 2022. They were both courting these evangelical politicians because they felt that obtaining their endorsement was essential for them to win. In this case, back in June last year, the leftist candidate Gustavo Petro won. You are listening to The Global Jigsaw from BBC Monitoring. So, social media seems like an important tool in the modern evangelical toolbox, alongside television, which has been used very effectively by evangelicals for decades, notably in the US. But the religious context in Latin America is unique. Here's Rafael Abuchaibe again with another quick fact file. 20% of the population in Latin America 
a traditional stronghold of Catholicism, now identifies as evangelical. It was only 4% in 1970. Many evangelical pastors have recently entered the political arena to endorse politicians or as candidates themselves. They are typically very conservative on social issues such as gay rights and abortion. In contrast, Catholics in Brazil today split roughly 50-50, left to right, in terms of politics. Liberation theology, the socially engaged left-wing movement within the Catholic Church, which began and flourished in Latin America in the 20th century, has not gone away. Evangelicals form a powerful bloc in many of the region's parliaments, particularly in Brazil. So, Luis, is it only really the evangelical churches that are active on social media? What about the Catholic Church? Is that even on TikTok? To tell you the truth, Gracia, I've never seen a bishop in Colombia on TikTok or in Brazil or in other countries, a Catholic bishop. But I think what you could say is that the institution as a whole has been much, much slower to adapt to this brave new world of social media-dominated communications in Latin America. How religious are these messages actually? Do they always join the dots with God? Not always directly. Some of their messages are presented as almost lifestyle advice. But there is the implication, of course, that the way the people are asked to live their lives has a religious background. How would you describe the politics of these evangelicals? Are they all the same? They are seen as a strongly conservative movement. And that is one of the elements that has caused controversy the idea that evangelicals are moving the discussion of many social topics in Latin America strongly to the right. It's worth remembering that nearly 60% of Latin Americans still consider themselves Roman Catholics. And as we heard in our fact file, about half identify as left-wing, with radical liberation theology still playing a part. Does that have much political influence today? Latin America right now is being governed in the majority of countries by left-wing governments. Some people talk about a pink tide, a red tide. There's many ways to describe it. I'm sure that in many of these cases, there are figures of the Catholic left influencing the thought of these leaders who are getting elected. But I don't think the Catholic Church is doing a deliberate effort across the continent to move the ideological spectrum to one side or the other. It may be that Catholic bishops are missing a trick in not using social media to get their messages out. Although, as we know, it doesn't work for everyone. Some politicians in the region have come unstuck trying to join in the TikTok wave. I think it's a double-edged sword. For example, in the Colombian presidential election, a conservative figure who was sympathetic to some of the evangelicals called Rodolfo Hernández completely based his campaign on social media and particularly TikTok. He appeared out of nowhere. He is a relatively old man in his late 70s, I believe. And one of his first TikToks was, am I too old for TikTok? Que estoy muy viejo para tener TikTok. And he very nearly won the election. And many other candidates, when they saw this dramatic upsurge of support, they tried to do TikTok dances that maybe their daughters or their teenage relatives taught them, and the results were disastrous. So far, we've been focusing on the medium, in this case, social media, because this is now how many people get, share and discuss information. And that's not an issue unless the information is false. So let's look more closely at the message. Fake news and disinformation are, of course, global phenomena and a key focus of BBC monitoring. And Latin America seems to be particularly fertile ground. Rachel again. I'd say the region is particularly vulnerable to fake news because there's really low trust in the media and in politicians. And there's also high political polarization. So both aspects significantly affect how much fake news sticks with the population. And recent polls have shown that this is the case in Latin America. So I think countries like Venezuela and Nicaragua, where governments have more of an authoritarian bend or where they're more likely to censor 
news. People rely more on fake news in those countries than probably anywhere else. In big countries like Brazil, where traditional media tends to have a specific editorial line, in countries like Chile, where that's the case as well, disinformation really plays a big role in the political landscape. It seems that the countries where people rely more on social media are the countries where disinformation is more of an issue. Here's a press release from a regional disinformation initiative. It's not about isolated, misleading pieces on a WhatsApp thread or the touching up of a certain photo, phrase or video. It is about total campaigns orchestrated to install narratives that slowly permeate the citizenry and transcend from the virtual scene to the social discourse. If that wasn't entirely clear, Rachel has been tracking many of these narratives on social media for BBC Monitoring. A big example, I'd say, is the flurry of disinformation that there was on Twitter, WhatsApp and TikTok on migration routes to the US and how easy it was to get to the border and to cross it. There was recently a really big amount of misleading claims made about the Darien jungle, which is between Panama and Colombia, and it's really dangerous. A lot of TikToks and people on social media were diminishing the danger and the length of journeys that flooded social media, and we saw and tracked how in comments people were reaching out to human traffickers and coyotes, and people really make decisions to take the risky trip based on that. That story alone is worth a whole other episode. It sounds like a powerful example of media narratives actually costing lives. Another example that was already mentioned is the Brazilian presidential election last year. In it, the Electoral Supreme Court said the number of reports of disinformation it received had increased over 1,000% compared to 2018 presidential elections. So that's a whole lot. The scale of that jump is hard to get your head round. A thousand percent during a globally significant election. Experts will surely try to unpick just how much difference this flood of fake news made to the result in Brazil. Although some of it was pretty bizarre, like one post Luis spotted. There was a specific and rather dramatic example of apparent disinfo in this election when a TikTok user presenting himself as a Satanist expressed support for Lula. So what that video shows is a person dressed in a very outlandish way, with a red cape around him and strange symbols adorning his walls. You can hear Carmina Burana playing in the background. The video also shows what looks like some kind of shrine to Lula. This guy has over a million followers, And he is saying that he expects Lula to win and that this would be a victory for Satanism. Inevitably, pro-Bolsonaro accounts picked up on this and claimed that, as one of them put it, the most famous Satanist on TikTok expresses support for Lula. However, Lula's campaign was very quick to distance itself from these claims. The protagonist also said his statements had been taken out of context. However, these videos were very widely circulated. And in the very final days of the campaign, a lot of people in Brazil were talking about Satanism. This is all quite eye-catching. But of course, this information is not a joke. It can be dangerous. Countries around the world have struggled to regulate social media. How's Latin America doing? Rachel again. So in Latin America, traditional media is heavily regulated, but governments have definitely been slow to regulate social media. In most countries, there are no clear rules governing platforms, legal responsibility for the content that they host. There's, for example, in Colombia, laws that apply to social media on libel and defamation, But of course, not all fake news or hate speech can qualify as libel or defamation. In Brazil, there's a law that does regulate the Internet, but it mostly protects access rights, privacy and freedom of speech. It doesn't sanction disinformation or fake news. Some governments, such as those of Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua and El Salvador, have used the excuse of fighting fake news to silence, attack or discredit dissenters critics and members of the opposition on social media. For their part, these governments say they're merely countering hostile, politically motivated social media campaigns. It's no surprise to hear that some governments in Latin America 
as in many other parts of the world, have been using and manipulating social media for their own ends. In Venezuela, where there's a lot of censorship and persecution of dissenters, the government has really been using social media as a propaganda tool. There's even been some top officials who have been banned from Twitter, including military leaders and top ministers. And they've also used this excuse of fake news. In Venezuela, there's this hate law to attack political opponents. There's also the case of El Salvador, where President Nayib Bukele has been denounced for blocking social media accounts and persecuting people who speak against his government on social media, especially on Twitter. And the same is true for Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega. And do you think people care enough to make it a political priority? I can't really say that I think it will become a priority for people or for politicians to tackle it because it's a very delicate subject in the region that has experienced a lot of censorship and in its history it has experienced authoritarianism, dictatorship. So the balance is always going to be complicated. So much for government regulation. But what about the social media companies themselves? most of which make great claims to ethical behavior. Are they making any serious efforts to self-regulate? Many companies are saying that they have to be more responsible about the way their platforms are being used. One of the issues is that these platforms are very careful with what is published in English while not paying enough attention to what is published in other languages. And of course, Latin America is maybe not ground zero, but a huge spot of disinformation. Many analysts would say that there hasn't been a huge amount of action to self-police these platforms. As we've heard, TikTok is a favorite platform for the evangelicals we are discussing. But because it's owned by a Chinese firm, ByteDance, Many are worried that Beijing could use the app to harvest users' data or advance its national interests. Despite attempts by both China and the company to offer reassurance, several governments and regulators have taken action to ban it. How is all of this viewed in Latin America? You know, there is some element of controversy on the Chinese connection of TikTok. However, I'd have to say that many people in the region aren't comfortable either with American-owned companies being so prominent in the social media landscape. For example, the president of Mexico, Andres Manuel López Obrador, very famously said that he didn't like the fact that Western-owned social media companies could eventually kick him out of this social media platform or could kick out any of the leaders of the region. And he even called for a national social media platform that wouldn't be subjected to what he saw as foreign interference. This really hasn't happened yet. There's no Mexican TikTok or Mexican Twitter. In Latin America, as elsewhere, social media has transformed politics. What's different here is the prominence of highly political evangelical preachers who have taken to social media as ducks to water in an exceptionally lax regulatory environment. Evangelicals across the region did not quite succeed in getting their preferred candidates into top positions in recent elections. But this mix is powerful and one to watch. Thanks to Luis Fajardo, Rachel Krigia and Rafael Abuchaibe. The producers are Lucy Bailey and Krista Shaturi. The sound engineer is John Boland and our editor is Judy King. This is the Global Jigsaw and I'm Krasi Twig. And we'd love to hear from you. If there's a story you'd like to hear in future episodes, you can get in touch. Our email address is theglobaljigsaw, all one word, at bbc.co.uk. Global Jigsaw.